Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And we are back today in the European hangar. And we're back from Reno. All the birds are home and we're talking about the night fighters. We're continuing to go now night fighter lane with the knocked fighter, Greg. Knocked fighter. The night fighter. You know I spoke German, did you? I don't speak German. So that's probably the Germans are going, gosh, he just butchered that. We're talking about the uh, Messerschmitt, the BF-110, which was the Zorster. But first, uh, is this like a Teutonic hat? Is that what you're doing here? Too? Greg's like, oh yeah. So I will take off my Teutonic appendage. Oh, there was almost close there. And my Cimmerarian friend who caught the hat there. And we're going to get into the uh, 110. Now the 110 was really designed in the early 1930s or was requested in the 1930s by the German Ministry of Defense. I'll go up, throw up a plan view of the airplane there. The idea behind it was they were always already developing uh, single seat fighters. They knew uh, they were they were thinking they were going to have to go back to war. They knew it was happening. What they're trying to do is develop a whole series of what I would call attack aircraft. And one of it was they were working on the BF-109, and then they wanted a heavier fighter. Really, Ernst Udet was working through trying. He was the proponent of this kind of heavy fighter. Now, you can see that you know you could have somebody protect your six you could with your tail with a tail gunner uh the you had two engines so you had added safety i mean i can see why they wanted to do it the thing was armed to the teeth you had uh heavy weapons up front sometimes 20 millimeter cannons sometimes machine guns you could go with an under pack belly pack for that and they they felt that this thing could kind of break through along with their single seat fighters, could break through uh, enemy fighter defenses. And then also, it could carry a bomb load. So it had a bomb load so it could attack targets on the ground. So that was the kind of thinking behind the Ministry of Defense. So the first flight of this uh, destroyer uh, happened in 1936. It was introed in 1937. It was retired, I would say, forcibly in 1945, the Luftwaffe went away for a period of time. There were 6,170 of them built, had a top speed, depending on everything, about uh, 295 miles an hour. Now they were using early Dolmer Benz engines, DB engines in it. Now there were two problems with that. One, they were competing against other German industry for those engines, for aircraft, those high performance engines. The other thing, they had some teething problems with them. They had some teething problems. So, Greg, they weren't as as good as they could have been, but the aircraft progressed. Now, when they got it and they actually flew the airplane, a couple things popped out, which is to me was kind of interesting. One was that the airplane was pretty fast. It was actually very fast. It could not turn as well, but the reason they liked it and they threw it into production was it was faster than the BF-109B1 at the time. So think about it, it was faster than the, the German single seat fighter. Now, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on ground attack on this airplane because we really wanna talk about the night fighter. But the aircraft was used and aircraft types, the A, B, and C models were used heavily on the Western Front and anywhere the Germans attacked they used them to break through. Now, where did they run into their nemesis, Greg? Their nemesis was the Battle of Britain. The Germans, the Germans, the whole blitzkrieg and the combined arms use of uh, aircraft and different types of aircraft to attack one point uh, in the front and then break through worked really well, unless you ran into the British. And what did the British have? British had radar and they had developed the uh, a way, a, a home chain defense that could actually vector large numbers of fighters into wherever the Germans were massing. So two things happened. One, whenever the Germans flew sorties into the UK, 
they were being met by a large number of fighters. It wasn't like France and some of these other things where you kind of go up and hunt around for the enemy. The British knew where they were. So they were constantly being attacked by concentrated um, aircraft from, uh, from the, uh, the RAF. The other thing they found out rather quickly was the airplane could not dogfight. So the, they had a lot of problems. One problem was the 109 did not have a lot of TOT, the time over target. So the 109s, a single engine 109 fighters, couldn't be used in combined arms with these aircraft or in combined attacks. And so these guys were kind of on their own. Now they would go over, they would try to bomb, they would try to do all kinds of different things, but they got shot to pieces. And just like the Ju-87, which was, Greg, Greg, the Stuka, the Stuka and the 110, and you can argue with me if you want in the comment section, I'm happy to do that, but these were the, the two German types that really did not come out of the Battle of Britain, I would say well. The 110 was better than the Ju-87. The Stuka really came out of the Battle of Britain uh, chewed up and Stuka squadrons. It wouldn't be until fighting in the Mediterranean and uh, in North Africa that the Stuka would come back. And then later on the Eastern Front as a tank killer with the, those 37 millimeter cannons under the wings. But the 110 uh, didn't fare much better. It, it could not attack the British in its primary role of, of being, let's say, breaking through defenses without a fighter escort. So you can't give the heavy fighter a fighter escort because that just doesn't make any sense. So it just didn't work out. So now the Germans had a problem. What was the problem? They had a weapon that they had mass produced. I mean, they built, at the end of the war, they built uh, 6,100 of these things. Uh, they had a problem that they had a weapon in search of a purpose. Now something came in and changed that. What was it, Greg? It was radar. Now, as the Germans gradually switched over to uh, defensive operations, they realized that suddenly they were going to have to defend uh, the homeland, the, the Vaterland. They were going to have to defend it. So what ended up happening was uh, the, British, the, the, uh, the British decided that they were going to do, we've talked about it before, but area bombardment at night. And they felt that that gave them under the cloak of darkness, the ability to attack German cities. And the Brit what the British would do is they would say there was a target uh, somewhere in, in an area in one of the German cities. They would just bomb a square. They, they basically felt if the target was in there, they'd come in, they'd level the entire thing. That has been debated, and we're not going to debate it here today over the, the ethics of it, but the, the British would just come in and take out a section at a time and they hoped they got the target. The Americans were going to come in with the Norton bomb site and do strategic bombing, and they were going to do daylight bombing, and we have B-17s in this hangar, which is why I'm gesturing over my right shoulder, because you cannot see the Memphis Bell, but it is over there, take my word for it. And the Americans were going to just fight the Germans, right, go right at them and break through their defenses and, and do this targeted bombing. Well, the Germans had a problem. They had to be able to defend against both attacks. These night fighters, and this aircraft does not have the kind of, uh, I want to call it the birdcage appendage that comes off of it that was a, the, the classic night fighter. But the Germans were also working on night fighter technology, and they had figured out how to miniaturize the night fighter. Uh, the radar into this canopy here. So now you had a fairly big airplane that was really well suited for it. And the first one that the Germans built was the BF-110, the F-4, which was the first kind of dedicated German night fighter. And the, one of the things the Germans would do is they would put a whole bunch of like, let's say 20 millimeter cannons here, and they would be pointed up like this. And the Germans would fly underneath the bombers and shoot into their bellies. And that was how they would shoot it. They wouldn't try to get on their tails or whatever, not to say that that didn't happen. But what the, the Germans developed was this way where they, the gunner would come up underneath or they might do a rear attack. You would not do a head-on attack at night with the night fighter because there's just no way that you can judge the distance 
of that um, Halifax, Bristol, whatever they're up there, bomber that's that's coming at you. So they wouldn't do that. They would come in from behind or below, maybe above, but they would probably not be above them very often. So, so that was the plan. In fact, Major Heinz Wolfgang Schnaffner, I, if you're there and your family is there, I hope I did not butcher your name. Uh, he had 124 victories in the BF-110 on 164 sorties. So he had a very, very high kill rate every time he went up. He was Germany's top night fighter ace. So when, the one thing I want to, so we're going to do salute today, and we're going to do it a little bit differently. And the salute we're going to do today is to all of the civilians on both sides that had to deal with not only the blitz, but all of the combatants in the war that had to deal with this bombardment that were civilians. This was a really difficult thing, whether you're on the British side, you're on the German side, or later with the Japanese with aerial bombardment, uh, war has really changed. And to all of those poor civilians who got caught in a crossfire and lost their homes and, you know, in many cases, their lives and all their livelihoods, uh, I salute all of you and your families. And today, I'm going to do it with, okay, boomer. Is that like I'm a baby boomer or, okay, yeah, he's shaking his head. Okay. Back in the day, soda was better. Yeah, so I, I guessed it. You, you were, you're after me. I am an aging boomer. I'm on the back end of that. Let's see. A taste so powerful, it can turn the most acquiescent and fierce street protesters Always thirsty for more, more, more. This this is could be a dangerous soda. Now the it is red hot cinnamon soda, but it is blue. Oh, Greg, you're blowing my mind here. All right, there was a fizz there. Let's see, 170 calories. They're always 170 calories. Why is that? No answer from the Greg. Uh, looks fairly new. There's a lot of other writing on here. Whoever did this label went absolutely nuts. Old school taste from a time when people were taught by teachers, not bloggers. This, I'm telling you, there's all stuff all over this label. I'm not going into this because I could start a fight here. But uh, to all of those poor civilians that got caught in the crossfire, I salute you. You know, I really thought I was going to hate this. It's not bad. Greg's like really disappointed. Greg was looking for a major, it may like burn my mouth out. It's like a, it tastes like a red hot. Like somebody dropped a red hot, but it's not super red hot. It's kind of frisky. Frisky, good word. Mm. Greg, I actually, that one's not, that one's not as offensive as, the last seven you've given me. I know you're disappointed, but uh, but we're gonna leave that soda there. So the 110, the F4, F-4 version was the the kind of the, the, the version into the night fighters. One of the things that the Germans did was the A through the C model had a large mouth radiator underneath it. And then when the Germans developed the DB601 um, B1, dash B1 engine, they changed the radiators and moved them into the wings and they slicked up the nacelles, they slicked the aircraft up, it was a little faster. And the BF110 G4 in this particular design then became the Apex Predator. That was the Apex Predator. This aircraft in the right hands flown by the right pilot that knew his machine could be incredibly dangerous. As it ran into P-51Ds, the later model P-47s, uh, they, it was hopelessly outclassed because they were much faster than this airplane, say 100 miles an hour faster. But uh, flown in the right hands, it could be incredibly dangerous. Now, a Fred fun fact, we have not done a Fred fun fact in a while. We should have like beeping lights. What do you think, you know, there's mouths on airplanes, like the P-40s and the 
uh, other airplanes, they draw like a shark's mouth. The earliest known documentation, and I don't know the unit, of a shark's mouth being painted on an aircraft, Greg, was with a BF-110. So that's kind of a little fun fact. That's the earliest known documentation. If you know one that I am wrong about, or you know one that is earlier than that, go right ahead, but that was on the Western Front right at the start of the war. So that's kind of cool. Now, if you want to excite your friends and bring them over, this is a great image, by the way. What a fantastic image. This is a fine art panoramic puzzle suitable for framing. Greg, suitable for framing. This one is, um, of course, of the iconic Spitfire during the Battle of Britain. I have seen this image before. Uh, it's on a lot of lithographs and stuff like that. This is great. If you want to get this, go ahead and click on that link. Jason will happily send that out to you, and you will be the talk of the town because you will have that Spitfire lithograph in your home for your personal enjoyment. Now, uh, we cannot do what we do here today without your donations. Click on that donation link, send us a few bucks. If you've come across us on YouTube, all we do are long form aviation videos. If you can get past the hat and the drink and the wacky stuff, we do try to give you some interesting information about military aircraft and we would encourage you to subscribe. Give us a like if you're on Facebook, give us a thumbs up. We would love to have that, and plus a comment. We like talking to you. If you have any ideas, send it back to us. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks so much. Have a great day.